something to say. Hi everybody, how you doing? Hope you're doing really good. It's a special time of year. If you know what I'm talking about, then you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, don't worry about it. It's all good. Special time of year. So, my name is Charlie. You might know me better as sci-fi fantasy writer C.E. Dorset, and I wanted to continue our deep dive into Avatar The Last Airbender and talk about Zuko today. Oh, Zuko. And I actually wanted to pick up what we talked about last time in when I basically tore apart the M. Night Shyamalan movie, and kind of argued for how I would have made it if I had made the film. And one of the things I said towards the end of the episode, I really stand by, and I've thought about it for about a week now, and I actually think it would have been a brilliant way to do the series, because there really is no real reason to turn an animated series into a live-action series. There isn't. They're both visual mediums, and I could understand maybe wanting a more condensed version of the story so that you can onboard new viewers and get them into the franchise and get them into the setting and into the world. I can understand that to a certain degree, but I I think it is a leftover relic of this idea that live action is a prestige medium, whereas animation is is, you know, that crappy little thing we make for kids. It's not really a movie. It's not really a TV show. It's, it's, it's animated. And I think that's an antiquated way of thinking. I don't think it works particularly well anymore because, well, one, animation has taken on a language of its own. So take a show like Steven Universe. Steven Universe is a show that just would not work in live action because the exaggerated reactions and the very nature of a character like Amethyst would not translate at all to a live-action scenario because she's over-the-top, she changes her shape constantly to reflect mood, her jokes. I mean, the idea of her turning herself into a beach ball with a face that bounces up and down trying to get Steven to play because he's sad that would not translate at all to a live-action story, and so you'd have to find other ways around it. And I think it would detract so much, because I don't think you'd be able to make Amethyst Amethyst in a live-action setting. I think you'd have to really rewrite her character so that she made sense in a live-action setting. Now, with a story like Avatar The Last Airbender, the characters don't have any really natural cartoonishness to them. I mean... They do take advantage of a lot of anime expressions and exaggerated expressions so that their emotional state and the humor is more present. But you can get away with a lot of that in film. I mean, either the way it was done in... um, Oh, what was the name of the movie? Uh, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, where they actually imported some of those anime faces, especially on knives in the movie. And I think they did it to both comedic and internal story logic sense um love that movie or you could just have them play it more human-like i mean that's not necessary to have those exaggerated facial expressions but i think one interesting way to do a conversion like this if you're going to do it is to change the focus of the story whereas avatar the last airbender the television show follows the adventures of sokka katara and ang and Yes, we do get POV from other characters' points of view, namely Zuko, who we're talking about today. The story, Zuko is not the protagonist of the story. He is a contagonist in the story, an antagonist in the story. He ends up having his own storyline towards the end, towards the end of book three. But he isn't, he gets less screen time than the other characters because in the end it's Aang's story. So if you were going to make a live-action movie out of a series that does not require a live-action movie to be made, one of the things that you could do to make it interesting, I think both for the audience and for the fans of the original material, is to find a different angle to approach the story from. 
because, well, if we wanted to see the adventures of Aang, Katara, and Sokka, we, we have the animated series. It exists, and there's nothing wrong with it. But what if we decided instead to tell the entire series, so we do a trilogy from Zuko's point of view? And, you know, as I said la last time we talked about this, call it something like The, last F the Lost Fireprint. Because Zuko has a very interesting story, and it allows you to do some things with Aang to make him more mysterious and more of a force of nature, and actually explore Aang's character from the perspective of someone who's not in his immediate circle. Because Zuko encounters him as a problem, as a force of nature, as a obstacle on his path to regaining his honor, and eventually, in book three, as a friend. And that journey is really a, a fascinating one. And for a the audience, maybe even a more interesting one from his point of view. So if we had the story of Iroh and Zuko, we get to tell the story much more from the point of view and the perspective of the Fire Nation and the troubles that we see in the Fire Nation, the problems that Iroh and Zuko see in the Fire Nation. We get to see more of the politics between um, Zuko and the various figures that he interacts with throughout the series, especially in our first film with Zhang. Because Zhang is his main obstacle, because Zhang agrees that the Fire Lord should have ostracized him for being a basically decent person, which has always bothered me that that was just accepted and it actually takes some time for Zuko to understand that no that wasn't right and there's new material you could add we we kind of talked about this a little bit before but it would be really interesting to go into the origin of the blue spirit and why he adopts this persona and why he has the mask and the swords available to him and it plays a lot with identity in a different way than the original series did because to hide who he is, he pretends not to be a bender for various activities that he undertakes as the Blue Spirit. And we know the Blue Spirit actually does more than we see in the film, because the Fire Nation eventually starts hunting the Blue Spirit as well as the Avatar. And that could make for a very interesting story, tell some of those untold tales of Zuko. And especially his journey up to the north, his journey following the Avatar, his journey of self-discovery. He has a... I think a very sympathetic character and by focusing on him we get to simplify and streamline the story of the last airbender we get to simplify the story of avatar down into something that's much easier to compress into a film because so much of the series when you actually look at it in hindsight once you get all the way to the end and get to look back on it is all of the things that Eng did that helped him raise the army necessary to face the fire lord at the end and yeah you'd have to explain some of that in course of the story but of course the main fight at the end is between him and azula and of course by the end of the third movie ang is now a fully fleshed character because in book three fire we have zuko and ang hanging out as friends we get to see them interact we get to learn more about them we have the journey up to the firebenders to learn the secret arts of the dragons and everything and that would all be brilliant to watch in a movie and of course the great final showdown where Zuko is fighting Azula and Aang is fighting the Phoenix Lord in the epic Titanic last battle but the story arc of this poor boy who was abused by his father and rejected from the fire nation because he spoke up for the little people. He didn't think it was right for the generals to just laugh off, well, we're going to send all of these people to their death. I mean, they were Zap Brannigan in their own army just to make a point that they could. They were going to send wave after wave after wave of our people to die, knowing that they're going to die, and not really for any appreciable success i mean we're not going to really get anything out of it but it tells the earth kingdom that we mean business and these people are just cogs in the machine anyway and they should be happy to die for the fire nation zuko speaks up at this meeting his father is offended by this challenges him to an agony kai 
a uh, duel of honor and de- not only defeats his son, who is not a fully trained firebender yet, but so beats his son in the Agni Kai and then scars, permanently scars his face and then expels him from the Fire Nation until he succeeds in this fool's errand of finding the Avatar that at this point everyone believes is gone. It, it's, it, he's basically saying, go find a unicorn and come back. If you don't find that unicorn, you can never come back. You can never have your honor again. And so poor Zuko, who is too young to understand that his father is a monster, and he eventually gets there, but he's too young to understand that his father is a monster and that he actually did the right thing and he did the honorable thing, which is why his uncle Iroh goes with him into exile to look after him, to train him, and to help him on his journey to become a better person. There's such a fascinating story in there. And it lets you do really fun things, like at the end of book one, at the end of the first film, when they're up in the frozen north, yeah, we probably should explain how Zheng dies. So we can play around with the timeline with Aang escaping from Zuko and have Zuko witness this Godzilla attack when Aang becomes fishy god man godzilla of water just ravaging the fire nation troops seeing that from zuko's perspective is horrifying and he it takes him a long time to not see ang as a monster and by not justifying ang's actions you know we can really kind of give light treatment to ang's actions so that he stays this monster in the story because we're trying to limit it to Zuko's perspective until we actually get to know Aang and can fill in some of those blanks, I think would tell a fairly compelling story and a very interesting one that's different from the one we have in the series, even though it's covering a lot of the same beats because we do get a lot of Zuko's story in the original. But that would at least justify having, justify the existence of your films and actually opens the door to doing more than three because you can do book one book two book three because i wouldn't compress his story more than that or it really would become muddled and aspects of it would be lost but there are these hints throughout the story that something happened with his mother and the question of what happened to his mother is kind of left dangling by the end of the animated series So you want to do a fourth movie or a second trilogy? Well, there's your second trilogy. What happened to Zuko's mom? And before you write in, call in, and tell me what the books, comics, and other associated media says about what happened to Zuko's mom, remember, a lot of people, their primary interaction is with the television series and don't even know that the ancillary material exists. This is one of the reasons why I've often said that reviewers need to actually go to wikipedia or wikipedia and get at least a basic idea before they talk about things because too often they don't and that's a topic for another time but the average person hasn't done that and isn't going to do that unless they really get into the lore and dig into it and you know it's kind of like did you know that there are dark crystal books that jim henson actually wrote out the full history of the world of the dark crystal and the exact origin of Agra and all of the other, the sages and the Skeksis in much more detail than actually appears in the movie. And you could actually do a Tolkien-esque dive into the Dark Crystal. Did you know that? See, probably not, because unlike me, you're not a crazy fan of the Dark Crystal. <laughs> and there's so much there that you could go into. But I have to accept that when people, when I'm talking to people about the Dark Crystal, their only experience is with the film and... The sequel that is apparently coming to Netflix, we'll see, fingers crossed, hopefully it's good. If not, I will still have my original film, which I love with all my heart. But there's so much material there that could be mine. And Iroh is such an interesting character, and Iroh does get lost in story for a little bit because, well, he and Zuko get separated, and it would be interesting to go into those stories. What was Iroh doing while Zuko was off with the Avatar? There, there, There is a lot of creative potential there. Is it the best way to make a film? I don't know, but I I think it at least gives a justification for the film existing. You know, I I don't really need a live-action Robotech film because I have the three seasons of the animated series and they hold up, I think, fairly well. I, I don't require that. But 
if you wanted to tell the story from a perspective that wasn't necessarily Rick Hunter's or Dana's or Scott's, you know, imagine retelling the Invid invasion solely from Marlene's point of view. That would be crazy. Or from purple, from Yellow Dancers. That would also be interesting. Or Rand's. That would be interesting. Because they're not the primary viewpoint that we get from the, from the original source material. So you're able to add something, tell the same story that you're wanting to tell, but give your creation a reason for being. And I know it's a controversial story to talk about, but this is what I love about Maleficent as opposed to a lot of the other Disney live action remake things that they've done. The Jungle Book was fine. I mean, it was good. I enjoyed it. I actually enjoyed it more than the original because I didn't really like it. Like the original Jungle Book. Don't tell my husband. <laughs> he, he liked it a lot. But you know, Maleficent had a reason for being because they decided to tell us the story from her point of view. And whether you liked that choice or not, I, I really did. It, it gave a reason for that film to exist, unlike the live action Beauty and the Beast or any of the others. And that's something I think you really have to think about when you were doing adaptation. Making a movie out of a novel, well, there isn't if there isn't already a visual medium version of it. Okay, there's a reason for doing that because not everybody's going to read the book. So now we can create a version of it that more people can interact with. That, that's fine. I think this is a, value, a valid and a very interesting way to approach this. And especially with a character like Zuko. Because... I almost wish the series had given me more about his relationships with his relationship because we get a sense of why they're rivals, but it doesn't really go into a lot of detail about that. You know, she seems to be her, their father's favorite and that sets up a lot of the rivalry between them. You know, Zuko was their mom's favorite and thus rivals or something like that. And, and that's not a bad thing. That's not a horrible reason. It's, it's an understandable one from a family perspective because, you know, in my own family, you know, I have a sister who's my mom's favorite and I have a brother who's my dad's favorite and there's nothing wrong with that. Like, it actually didn't create any rivalry with me because, you know, I, I, I am what I am and yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you see that sort of thing in families and I think it would have been very interesting to see some of those reactions more. You know, how did they fall apart when did they fall apart is there any chance that they could have gotten back together is there any did azula ever have a moment of doubt if i watch the tv series and i take the tv series at face value azula never questioned any of the things that she did for her father or for her nation and never questioned anything she did against Zuka. I don't think it would lessen her character if we found out that she had any angst about this at all, that she had any moments of doubt, because we see throughout the story her own unraveling, and to see her actually have kind of a conscience early in the series and watch that un just completely unravel as we're seeing Zuko build himself up and become a better person would be a very interesting contrast character that would really bring the movie to the new life. Because Zuko's swordsmanship is astounding. And I assume he learned that from Iroh. I might be wrong. I do think that that would be an interesting thing that you could also explore. Their journeys through the Earth Kingdom would also be interesting. There's so much that you could do there. But especially the rivalry between him and Azula. You could actually start it earlier because Azula doesn't story proper until the second season. You could try to actually bring her into the, fir the first movie. Or not. Zhang is a perfectly good villain for the first film. And a perfectly good analog for Zuko. And if you took the time to use Zhang as less a villain for the Avatar than as a counter version of Zuko. In so many ways, though he would never say it, Zhao, I'm sorry, Zhao, is the character that is who Zhao is the person Zuko wishes he was. He's loyal to a fault. He is masterful to a fault. He is good at firebending to a fault. And so by contrasting Zhao, who I think I've called Zhang through this entire episode, because I'm that person, uh, contrasting Zhao with Zuko could really make for an interesting character portrait and make Zhao's inevitable downfall so much more poignant because it plays off this idea of us doing a three-part trilogy, right? Because where Zhao ran headlong into the Avatar and was destroyed by that, 
we actually see the opposite happen with Zuko in the long run, where he runs headlong into the Avatar, befriends him, and together they save the world. That makes for a very interesting character contrast, and there's a lot of things that you could do. So, in my heart of hearts, I kind of wish instead of doing The Last Airbender, piece of crap movie that they did, they would have taken the time to do The Lost Fire Prince. And maybe someday someone will. Because in my heart of hearts, I, I think if you're going to make a film, you have to give that film a reason for being other than, I'm going to completely recreate this thing that already exists in a medium that's perfectly fine. It's kind of like the reboots of Star Trek. There's no need for us to reboot Kirk and Spock in them. We have them. Give us new characters, expand the world. Just give me more. <laughs> We didn't need to recast Kirk and Spock in them in the 90s, in the late 80s, early 90s. We got Jean-Luc Picard, Data, and Riker, and Troy, and all of them, which was a perfectly fine substitute. New characters, same world, on we go. You don't always have to do a reboot. And doing a film version of an animated series is, by nature, a reboot. So, yeah, there you go. There's so much more I could talk about with Zuko, but I think I've said enough. So hopefully you like this idea. If you do, let me know. If you want to contact me, head over to projectshadow.com. You'll see links to all my social media there. If you have and are listening to me through the Anchor app or are curious about it, if you download it at anchor.fm, you'll be able to leave me a one-minute voicemail message that I can use in the podcast. So do that if you feel like doing that. If you wish to support the show in any way... If the app that you're listening to me in allows you to rate the show, please do that. That helps a lot. Share this podcast to your friends, especially those that you think would like what I'm doing here. If you would like to support the show financially in whatever app you're listening to, if you go to the show notes, you'll see a support on Anchor. If you click that, you'll be able to donate one at the $1, $5, or $10 levels. That really does help a lot, even that $1 level. That may not sound like a lot. But if you can do that, that helps out so much because, you know, it takes time, energy, and effort for me to do these and takes me away from my books. And I like doing both. <laughs> so if you want to help out, that's a great way to do it. If you want to support everything that I do while you're at projectshadow.com, you can click the Patreon link and support me over at Patreon. That would be awesome. And that supports everything that I do, whichever you're more comfortable with. That would be awesome. And if you can't afford to support the show, that's fine. You can read my books over at Wattpad. Again, you can find a link to that over at projectshadow.com. Um, yeah, thank you so much for everything. You guys have made this show what it is, and your support is always welcome in whatever form it takes, even if it's the nice words that you guys have been sharing with me. Thank you so much. It means the world to me. Until next time, have the fun. Bye.